Hey, what's up, good people? It's Jay Ray, the co-host of Q Points, and I wanted to come to you because there are two really important ways that you can support our show. One is by subscribing to it wherever you listen to or watch your podcast. Q Points is pretty much everywhere. The other thing that you can do is you can visit us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on Podchaser, and you can leave us a star rating. Please rate us five stars because you know you love Q Points. And on Apple Podcasts and on Podchaser, you can actually leave us a written review. It's not required, but it really does help to spread the word about the show and it helps people to discover it as they're looking for new podcasts to listen to. We're always appreciative of you supporting Q Points. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us so far and enjoy the show. Peace and welcome back to another episode of Q Points Podcast. I am DJ Sir Daniel. And my name is Jay Ray, sometimes known by my government as Johnny Ray Cornegay the third. What's happening, folks? Y'all, Q Points Podcast is the podcast dropping the needle on black music history. And this episode is not unlike the others we are about to have a great time with this conversation yes. i see people in the comment section already people have been hitting us up on the socials have been really responding to the the graphics and thank you thank you so much for reposting those kinds yes. of things i was telling jay ray the other day i don't get tired of seeing y'all show us some love i you know i'm just be honest with you it does it makes me it, it makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. So please keep doing that. We we appreciate it. <laughs> we really do. <laughs> Jerry, please let the people know how they can see all our social media posts yes. and all the wonderful things, the graphics and, and pretty videos that we be putting out. And merch. You see how so DJ Sir Daniel is wearing the Slow Jams Can Heal Us merch? I still ain't got my mug. Child, I don't know why I use my Slow Jams Can Heal Us mug every day. Mm -hmm. And I have two of them. But when it's time to do the show, they're never in this room. But they're here throughout the day when I'm doing my stuff. Anyway, let's start there. One of the things that you can do is if you're like, listen, I really love Q Points and I want to support those brothers, go on over and to our store at store.qpoints.com. That's Q-U-E-U-E points.com. And you can buy some merch, including the Slow Jams Can Heal Us line we actually have a pride version two pride versions of slow jams can heal us so as we're coming up into june to pride month you can rock some cue points and some, some gear for that so that's to help us keep these lights on right if you are listening to us if you are seeing our faces that is the most important thing that you can do that means you are listening you are watching. It is absolutely free and it is the most important thing. And if you can do us a solid and hit the subscribe button wherever you are or and not and not or and share the show with your friends, your colleagues, your family. If you really love Q points, chances are they will love Q points, too. That is also free. And you should also join our mailing list. So if you visit our website, there's the whole pop up so you could join the mailing list. You can also join us over on our uh, blog at magazine.qpoints.com and you could get all things Q points delivered to you. We so happy that y'all are here. Shout us out in the chat too. let us know for those that are joining live. Um, let us know where you're joining in from. We would love to know. That's right. Excellent. So, you know, most of these topics, all of these topics come about when Jay Ray and I just get to talking, mm -hmm. especially during our, um, our, our Sunday meetings to talk about the show. And one of the spur, or I guess, splinter meetings or conversations that we were having while we were talking about Cowboy Carter and how, you know, the the people are really butthurt about Beyonce, this black woman doing country music. And, you know, she needs to stay in hip hop and R&B and, you know, stay in your place. Yes. 
is basically what they're saying. Stay, stay over there with all the other black stuff. And I just thought it was so interesting, the dynamics of how when white artists come on over and dip their toes into into black land, <laughs> into <laughs> into the into the lakes, into the waters of Lake Minnetonka, and think you know, and and do all the things you know. They adapt a black scent, you know. Start wearing Jordans, you know. Start wearing throwback skirts, and you know they they come over and they have a good time. They yes. they develop a weed habit, all of a sudden. <laughs> And they just come over and have a great time. But here's, but here's the caveat for me. Mm -hmm. And I've said this many times on this show. I am not one for giving out free passes to the, to the cookout. I, the cookout is not carte blanche for everybody. For me, if, it's, if I'm at the cookout, I'm checking IDs. How'd you find out about us? Who sent you here? You right. know, who, who did you come with? All of that stuff. Yes. So it's interesting that you you uh, you mentioned this because I think what those folks who dip their toe over on our side, right, also mm -hmm. oftentimes end up just leaving and going yeah. to do whatever it is that they're going to do once they reach their level of success. We've seen it a million times. Remember when Justin Timberlake, right? who just made mm. R&B albums forever, decided, you know what? Mm. I'm going to the woods. Mm. Now, I, I'm mm. going to revisit this record. Um, sidebar, you know the secret. I'm going to just tell everybody the secret. You know the secret because I told you I actually like the new Justin Timberlake record. That's another story. So I uh -huh. said it out loud. I feel free now. That's okay. no longer a you burden. Come out. The you point, come out as a, I come as out a fan of this Justin record. Of this Justin record. And many Justin records. Longer story. It's a guilty pleasure. But mm -hmm. the point is, many of these artists, what they do do is they dip their toe in and then they leave and they go and do something else. Right. The unique thing, though, about the artist that we're talking about tonight, Sir Dave, mm -hmm. is... She just dove in and stayed and sw kept swimming on this side. <laughs> and she became what is known as Black Famous. Yes. She literally. is very... So I guess, Jay Ray, okay, what is your definition of Black Famous? Black Famous is um, an individual who is pretty much universally famous among black folks mm -hmm. just generally across generations but you literally can talk to people outside of black culture that have no idea who they are and meanwhile you're like how could you not know who insert artist here is that to me is black famous what about for you no, I, your definition is perfect. I don't have anything to add on to that because, and there's only, I will say there's only a handful of people like that. Yep. There's only a handful of people like that. And, um, yeah, when I think of like Gary Owens, mm -hmm. you know, comedian, mm -hmm. literally the probably him being on the Wendy Williams show is probably like exposed him to more white people than he's ever been exposed to as a comedian. But of course he got his start in the, the black clubs. He got to start on BET. Yeah. And let's, you know, the artists that we're speaking about <clears throat> featuring on the show, of course, is none other than Mr. Miss White Chocolate Soul herself, Tina Marie. <laughs> and Tina, like Jay Ray said, Tina Marie has the distinction of standing 10 toes on big business and staying in the lane of being black famous. And, you know, we're just going to have a conversation about that, like Q points always does. Real quick, Sir Daniel. Yes. Um, I think we also, this is Tina, of course, Tina Marie would be the person that would be this person. Tina Marie is the first white artist that we featured on Q points in our over 100 shows. We've never mm. featured on Q points a white artist. That is true because well I mean, you know, Q points we 
we censor blackness. Yeah. We censor black music history. But of course, Tina Marie is one of those anomalies yep. that has come in, came in on a black label, got signed to a, yep. a black label, famous label, mm -hmm. and continued and doubled down and did the work. Yes. And I think that might be the key to her staying power. But J Ray, I think you should just break it down for, you know, the young people that might be <laughs> tuning in and we appreciate you for listening while you listen to the uncles, the uncles over here talk about all this old hip, all this old R and B and music stuff. But just break it down for them about Tina Marie and um who she is. We know you know some of her music, but take it away, J Ray. Yeah. So um, Tina Marie, to your earlier point, Sir Daniel, is kind of an anomaly. So let me just make something perfectly clear. Tina Marie's birth name is Mary Christine Brockert. <laughs> I want to say it again. Tina Marie's birth name is Mary Christine Brockert. She is definitely, she was definitely a white woman. Okay, let's be very, very clear. clear about it, right? So, of course, she began singing at a very young age um, as the un I went back and I, I watched the her unsung and um, Harry Belafonte and Dale was like the first thing that she remembers singing as a child, which apparently embarrassed her mother. It was apparently very embarrassing. <laughs> To have little Mary Christine. Yeah, because that's a that's a work song. Right, 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 right. Slave work song. Exactly. <laughs> right. To have singing the song. So born in Santa Monica, uh, California, um, spent all of her time, of course, um, in California, and began as a singer, but also Tina Marie has the distinction of being a multi-instrumentalist, right? So as she began to kind of uh, develop as a musician, she formed bands because that's the thing that people did. Like, and we talk about that a lot on this show, Sir Daniel, the importance of bands and, what you, and what you learn, right? So she, of course, um, formed a number of bands uh, before uh, kind of capturing the ear of Barry Gordy and Motown um, in the 1970s. And what I think is really important, I think there's a couple of things um, that set Tina up. Um, and it's contextual. I don't have any hard research on this, but I think these are important things to keep in mind. By 19, by the late 1970s, um, as Tina is preparing to release her debut album, um, Motown has been in L.A. for at least eight years or so since the early 1970s. They are changing. So Motown had even released I Was Born This Way. Motown has the Commodores now. Motown has Rick James now, right? This Motown sound that is ingrained in the DNA of a Black culture was changing in, 19, in the late 1970s. And also... Black folks were experiencing um, a, a bit of a heyday, right? So this is post-civil rights. Disco is churning. Folks is making a coin. You know, we got Black movie stars and Black everything, right? We got Black mayors around the country. Um, and so Tina Marie enters... Uh, our popular music lexicon at a time when there was room for her, right? There was room for this white woman to, who we didn't know was white at first, because of course Motown hid her. Y'all, <laughs> Motown hid her. Picture they wasn't on the record. What, they did what other labels were doing back in the, the race record days. Yep. They, instead of putting the artist on the cover, they did some very abstract art and had her eyes in the clouds and whatnot. So you didn't, didn't know they weren't releasing like, um, those, uh, headshots, mm -hmm. promotional yeah. headshots. They probably only released them to people that needed to know, like the, um, the radio stations mm -hmm. and whatnot, yeah. but I'm sure she wasn't on the cover of like Tiger Beat magazine or anything like that. <laughs> no. Right. So she comes and she emerges uh, with this first album 
and people really not knowing what this woman even sounded like, only knowing that this song was jamming. It had Rick James on it. I'm a sucker for your love. We getting into it. And I think it's also important for us to underscore as we jump into this conversation that we likely would not be talking about Tina Marie had Rick James not swooped her up and said to Mr. Gordy, I want to work with that little white girl. I want to work with her, right? We would not be having this Tina Marie conversation. As talented as she was, it was that Rick James sauce at the beginning that allowed us to be introduced to her. Well, that's the power of the black cosine, right? The black cosine is what, you know, to your earlier point, made Justin Timberlake um, popular in black households. Oh, whoa, that white boy can dance. That white boy can sing. He can play the pee up. He can play the piano. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's the cosign that it, who who had a really dope cosign. Um, mm, you know, Madonna had her cosign from <laughs> Chic from mm -hmm. Nile Nile Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty plenty of artists that got a cosign from you know if we t talk about we're going to talk about this later mm -hmm. but we could talk about people the um, rappers like terry b yep and uh vanilla ice didn't have one but the young black teenagers and just to say that the cosign yeah is a very for the the community and that's why i that's why i i have such a visceral reaction to these cookout questions mm -hmm. and and why and why do you think jay ray we are just so open and willing to allow somebody that to in my opinion is able sometimes is able to mimic yeah you know um flavor um to mimic blackness to mimic the singing because you know we're we can be dramatic we can mm -hmm. be perf very performative uh, in our performances and sometimes that i feel like people feel like they can parody that and they can make a mockery of it and get some type of recognition for that mm -hmm. um i agree with that i also i also wonder if because blackness has been so demonized mm. that we appreciate when someone outside of the culture sees us and wants to be part of it, right? Okay. I think that's, and I, I'm literally, I've only been, um, as I was getting ready for this show, kind of like wondering what that is, knowing that this was going to be part of it. But I do wonder if that's the case where we're willing to like invite you in because you see us, you are here with us and um, you doing it like we do it. And mm. other, and, and feeling like other, the world doesn't see us like that. Um, right. And I think we've gotten more sophisticated in recognizing when people are doing it and they are being performative and when people are doing it because it's who they are. And that's why I think Tina Marie is actually unique because this was just what she was doing in all the times she could have done something else. And Barry Gordy even said in the unsung, like, Tina was like really talented. She could have kind of done whatever she wanted to do. This was the lane. Like I'm going to stay in this R&B, this soul R&B lane. This is what I'm going to do. And so let's go. This is what she loved. This is what she felt comfortable with. Um, and her influences were there. Mm -hmm. And yes. And like in that same unsung, Tina Marie looked like, okay, if you all are familiar with the Carol King album cover um tapestry. tapestry it's an amazing album y'all go listen <laughs> absolutely tina that's what tina marie looked like a very kind of crunchy granola you know the the puff the puffed out wavy hair you know pair of bell bottoms real kind of granola but which is par for the course for that decade it was the late 60s early 70s mm -hmm. and that's what she looked like 
and but she was making the music to your point like barry gordon was like nah she's dope she, mm-hmm. she's really churning out all these songs and hits mm-hmm. she's churning them out by herself yep. because she's a, a fully um developed artist writer composer all of that stuff but um <laughs> you know to the point if Rick James wanted to work with her, Rick James gave her this sauce and swagged her out because by the time she got on American Bandstand and Soul Train specifically, mm-hmm. you know, Mama was had on her, her skinny disco pants and a glittery top and was like, you know, popping and doing the latest dances and whatnot because I'm sure she got a little training. Yes. You know, so one of the things I'm sure was very clear to Motown is that this woman cannot go into these spaces. Motown is all about selling a record, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this woman cannot go into these, spa- these spaces and choke, right? She got to be ready to go into these spaces and perform. So I agree. I'm sure there was very much a lot of preparation. I am certain that Rick was part of a lot of that training. You know what I'm saying? Um, because she just had to be able to do it. And if you're going to hit the road and go out on the road with Rick James and the Stone City Band, trial by fire, I can't imagine. <laughs> it, requires, it requires some toughness. It yes. really does. Especially the women. Because at that point, the women were really just backup singers and, you know, they're for eye candy and for, you know, jump offs for afterwards. But she's in the forefront. Yep. So to your point, she's got to show and prove like, oh, no, I, I'm here. And, you know, sometimes black crowds can be really tough, you know, Apollo style. So y- her first goal is to win over each crowd. And clearly she was able to do that. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's so funny. I still think about the cosign and, you know, uh, being adaptable to to black culture, to to, to black sense and to, to speaking it, it reminds me of that airplane movie <laughs> from the 80s airplane where where the, the there's two black gentlemen flying on the plane and this the flight attendant is trying her hardest to understand what he's saying because he's feeling sick and he needs help and the flight attendant is just like i i want to help but i just don't understand what he's saying and then the mother from leave it to beaver barbara billingsley yes leans over to the flight attendant excuse me maybe i can help i speak jive <laughs> and it is the funniest it, you know it's wrong so wrong but it's still funny at the same time because she's something what it is black what's going on man? What's, 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 cut me some slack. and and there he's like all right hey little mama cut me some slack my mom you know la 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 and then the funniest thing at the end is like he's like Man, little mama, go ahead on. I don't need your help. Right. And she's like, Chump don't want no help. Chump don't get no help. Jive turkey. Foolishness. Airplane. <laughs> oh, my God. This movie could not happen in 2024. It, it, listen, we can laugh now. I haven't seen Airplane <laughs> in years. I actually, I would probably still laugh. It was, it was, I remember it being really funny. It would probably still yeah. be really funny. But um, to that point, right? So in even just thinking about Tina and even her musical trajectory, right? So you get these first two albums. One, album one is written and produced by Rick James. So Rick James is all over it. I'm, I'm a just a sucker for your love. Deja Vu is on that record, though. I've been here before. Baby, that song. That's a song song, right? Mm-hmm. And then... There's an interesting, so Tina is having to do this thing where it's like every year there's an album. So then eight, so that's 79, then you have 80 with Lady T. Lady T is produced by Richard Rudolph, husband Maya of Minnie Rudolph. Ripperton, father of Maya Rudolph. Mm-hmm. Um, and Motown hires Richard Rudolph. So done working with Rick, we're gonna hire Richard. And then Richard is like, I mean, sure. But this this woman don't need our help. <laughs> like she's got it. She could do this on her own. Just let her fly. And it's that third album, Irons in the Fire, where Sir Daniel, 
I need your loving. Listen. And we, Young Love is on there. We then fully understand <laughs> what's possible. And that record was written and produced by Tina Marie. Um, and she plays a bunch of stuff. She writes, you know, all the stuff. She produces the whole thing. Um, her band is Ozone, which was like a huge, uh, important backing band at Motown. So she has like this crack band. She is writing these songs and producing them. And it's the first time that she kind of branches out. And we get to hear what a Tina Marie song sounds like. And so, and this is where the show and prove comes in. Yes. Because now you've got songs that have entered the, the lexicon, the black lexicon of music mm -hmm. you become she has become a part of our lives yes. because you throw on square biz specifically square biz i don't i don't know what it is i think it's the horns yeah. it sounds very celebratory mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's just funky it's just funky it's a funky record and it just has that stick to itiveness that the the culture the community will not let that song go yeah, no, I agree. You know Square Biz, and I just thought about this. Square Biz is one of those unique songs that has, you kind of fall into it. Because, you know, she gives you the wee! Yeah, yeah. She and gets it, your attention right at the beginning. Yep, and it rides into the groove. And you got all of that. So I feel like, but you're right in the stick to of Square Biz because that song, of all the Tina Marie songs, and it's not even her biggest hit, but it's her most enduring classic where cross generations. Sir Daniel, when you and I were um, at uh, Jeremy Avalon's party, um, yep. high key disco in Atlanta, you we're seeing your uncle, me, Uncle J Ray, and Uncle Sir Daniel is up in here, just the oldest. We are, we are here. <laughs> we're the oldest brothers up in here, right? But these young people are getting it. To Square Biz. The young people were throwing down to Square Biz. And I don't even think, and I don't even know that they have a real concept of, they don't have the concept, they don't have the the background of Square Biz and what those parties, what it means to parties. But what it was is that it's just, sonically, it's just a great song and it's a great groove. And they, regardless of how old you are, it pulls you in. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly, that's the hallmark of a great song and great music. And we, yes, J. Ray and I witnessed it. And funny enough, you bring that up. I wonder with those same young people, because, you know, young people can be really critical. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if Tina Marie was a 2020s artist that was mm. coming out. Would people be so open to embrace her? Would she be considered problematic, trying to appropriate? You know, is she a culture vulture? I'm wondering, would she be readily accepted today as say she was back then? You know, you know, that is a really good question. And honestly, I don't know that an artist like Tina Marie could even make it today. I don't know that there's room mm -hmm. for, I don't know that she could get out the gate is what I'm really saying. Like, I don't know that with all of that talent, I don't know that she could get really far. She might get a first album. Hell, she might even get a second album, but I don't know that we have the back bandwidth. then. Yeah, bandwidth back then there was room, like there was an opportunity to give people a chance, and uh -huh. I think yep. we're fortunate that we were able to get her when we did because yeah, just I don't know, and I'm curious to know with folks for those that are joining us live. Uh, what what are your what are your thoughts on that? Could Tina Marie, uh, an artist like that, even work today? I don't know that there's an appetite for for two things. One, the style of music and the heavy instrumentation, right? Because these songs are composed 
Um, but also to your point, like just the white woman in black culture, steeped mm-hmm. in black culture in that way, I think it would be a hard pill to swallow from a um from a from a musical perspective. Because is there today who we've tried it? We tried it with Iggy Azalea. It didn't work out. Did we? Well, we did. I don't know that. That's kind of that's apples to kiwis right there. I don't know about that about Iggy is there. That's not the first comparison you want to make, right? Was, so maybe not else? Iggy. You know you love that freestyle, Sir Daniel, when she was up there. Stop that! Stop it right now. Because like even a even like a you can't even compare. You can't compare her to Madonna. That's. Because they came almost came around around the same time. They're very similar Um, time frames. Yeah. Huh? I don't who they're Alicia. Well, mm -mm. yeah, that's gonna be that's a that's a hard comparison. Again, anybody in the chat that's watching this live, let us know what your if you think there's anybody that could compare to a Tina Marie today, or whether or not you believe Tina Marie as we know her could make it as an artist in the 20 in the 20s the roaring 20s yeah. and the way music is presented and um but also in this climate of people you know safeguarding and and um policing blackness yeah. um and black culture and calling out appropriation at any time that when they see it cuz you know with social media oh it's going to be it, it'll probably be a rap for her the first time she comes out with her hair with her hair tightly coiled like that and wearing yeah. some cockle shells, <laughs> yep. it's probably gonna be a rap for her. Like, who is that? And what is she trying to do? What is she trying? Absolutely agree. And um, even just thinking of the songs themselves. So I think less so since we were on Square Biz, I think we stay with that record, which is her fourth album. Um, It Must Be Magic, which has Square Biz on it, which also has my favorite Tina Marie song on it which is Portuguese love, mm-hmm. Portuguese mm-hmm. love, which was, ne- which was it a single? I think it was the last single from the record, but it's really just a quiet storm staple. And even just thinking about that song, right? Where she's singing about this night, she fell in love in Portugal, which, which, with, um, which with possibly a man of Portuguese background. I, I, I even that song is so funny. I'm like, I don't even know if that could happen today, <laughs> right? Could we do right. Portuguese love? <clears throat> could we even do that? It lo- she's l- lucky. We're lucky that she was around and came around in the time frame, the time span that she did, because she was allowed to cook as an artist mm-hmm. and to and had the freedom that we would allow people to back then. But yeah, nowadays, I don't know. And even sometimes, like, I, I, I give it up for Tina Marie. I enjoy her music as well. And she's meant a lot to hip hop. But sometimes those vocals, <laughs> and I think we can say this here on Q Points. We can. They Those beast. vocals, they, you know, there were some times when I was like, hmm, I know. you know, I don't know. You know, there was a little trill in oh. her voice at times. And it was it was doing it was doing a lot sometimes. But I think I think the earnesty in which she was singing and the, the lyrics. Yeah. Mama could paint, she could paint a picture. She, she paint a picture. definitely could. And I think that that is her saving grace and all, all of her other talents, of course, were her are the saving grace. So I think we kind of kind of look past some of those little shrilly moments that she would have. And that's okay because all of even artists that we love a black artist, there's some black artists and I'm not going to name names, but they, they have given us some questionable vocal uh, performances, but we love them we, down. We dare anybody to say anything about, you know, auntie or uncle, we love them down. And that's that. And I think the thing to keep in mind, even because as I was revisiting Tina's catalog, you know, I had to remember that also as a vocal stylist, a song stylist, <laughs> a song <yeah>. stylist, <laughs> she had a unique delivery, right? Her vo- yes. her her voice. There's not another voice like that. You know what I'm saying? Like it was a unique mm-hmm. delivery 
And fortunately, to your point, it it arrived at a period of time where um, the combination of the lyrics, the musicality, and all of those things gave it room to be able to like move a little bit. And I mean, from a storytelling perspective, um, I mean, listen, she wrote Casanova Brown about Rick James, about this man who had all of these women around, but she was still in love with this person. Mm -hmm. So she writes this song about a person that is a superstar that we all know and releases it and it becomes its own hit. (laughs) That's not to be messed with. It isn't. And, you know, to her, to her credit, she was able to hang with Rick on possibly the biggest song that they're both a part of, and that's Fire and Desire. Because they didn't, and now, and in all honesty, Rick has some questionable moments, oh, absolutely. some questionable vocal, vocal moments on that song as well. But it's still a classic. It's still a karaoke, you know, you kill a karaoke with that one. It's a great duet. It's dramatic as hell. So it checks off all the boxes that people, you know, that people go up for for a song and what makes it a classic. And she hung with him. Yeah. And when and their live performances is really what sells it. Mm -hmm. You know, the and the drama is there, you know, the backs turn to each other and the singing to each other. You can't. You know, you can't fake all of that. You you really have to really believe in yourself and believe in the song and still and have some type of relationship with the person that you are having that duet with. And so you can't fake any of that. Nope. And I think that is the crux of what we're saying on Q Points is that Tina is an anomaly in the sense that she never faked anything. Mm-hmm. She was always true to her, you know, to her love for the community. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what kept her um, in in the graces of the Black community. Like, when she passed away, I think, if, <laughs> and I might get some flack for this, if they were still doing those paintings of um, <laughs> Jesus... Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and JFK, those kind of um, paintings that were always in Black households and have all the the montage of all the Black people that have passed away. Tina Marie is definitely in one of those paintings that you find in Black households paying homage to all of our fallen um, heroes. She's definitely in there. That that tickles me so much. Much. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all know exactly the paintings. If, I, I promise you, we can go to a, a flea market right now and find one of those. Instead of the um, the Last Supper with Jesus and his apostles, it's going to be the a table full of Black artists and Tina Marie, Marie at the table um, re- replicating the Last Supper. It's Come on, it's just what we do. I, you know what? I, I receive that. I absolutely do. And I think, yeah, to your point, you know, of this this artist being just like a one of one artist where even in those times, even when she felt, even when her style of music kind of fell out of favor, right? Mm. In the in the early 1990s. And and I didn't realize this at the time, but when I rewatched the unsung, she talked about the fact that she like, I chose to step away because, you know, I had a child. I I'm a, a new mom. I wanted to be a mom. And having a record deal would mean I need to record. It would mean I need to tour. And it would mean I, I had to be away from my daughter. And I didn't want to do that. And I respect it. Um, two notes, Sir Daniel. First note yep. is um, Passion Play by Tina Marie needs to be on streaming services. Okay? Shout out to Tina's daughter and her and her family. If we could get that on streaming services for the folks. I see Carlton in the chat. If I know Carlton, I know Carlton has passion play. Carlton probably has a copy of it. Carlton probably has a copy. So um, shout out to that album, which was her independent 94 record. Look at Carlton in the chat. I have that CD, of course. See? We (laughs) we know. (laughs) The last thing I wanted to um, mention um, was... There's a parallel, I think, to the Snoop conversation that we had late last year. In um, Tina Marie, her her 
her last, well, two of her last three albums were on Cash Money, which I remember at the time being very weird. But then those records just sounded like Tina Marie records. Like they didn't, they sounded nothing like what Cash Money was doing because they were written and produced by Tina Marie. So she was essentially just doing 2000s Tina Marie songs. And I appreciate that so much that I'm sure Baby and them was just happy to have Tina Marie on the label. Right. But this idea of Tina Marie doing the Southern Reset, right? Because it had been 94 Passion Play comes out. Uh, the Danya comes out in like 2005. You know what I'm 2006. So it had been over a decade. And she was able to do that in the South. And then her final record was on Stax after they re kind of started that label, which is again, another Southern label um, where Tina Marie was able to still be Tina Marie, Mm -hmm. but do it in the South and be able to have Smokey Robinson guesting on two songs on the Sapphire record. Nobody was like doing Smokey Robinson as a featured artist in 2007 or whatever and sapphire is a beautiful bridge building record so saying all this to say as she even fell kind of back and that style of music that she did fell out of favor when she got down to the south in the early 2000s she still was committed to doing tina marie stuff even in a modern way which is really dope well, and I think she was given um, room and the platform to do that because you, to your point, being signed to Cash Money, Baby, Slim and them, those are all Gen Xers, right? Mm-hmm. Those are all people that were reared and raised on Square Biz, on Behind the Groove, on Fire and Desire. So we meaning the black community have an allegiance to those to those to that music and because you have created this art that is long standing and um means something to the community they're like oh it's a no brainer we're going to sign uh Tina Marie and because Tina Marie is one of those people that embraced hip hop mm-hmm. hip hop embraced her back I mean, if you think about it, think about how how connected Tina Marie is to hip hop history. Yep. Listen to if you listen to Sierra's one two step and Missy spits her rhyme. What rhyme is Missy spitting? She's mm-hmm. spitting her own version of Tina's rap on Square Biz. Mm-hmm. I'm five for one, I'm full of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 fun. Mm-hmm. You know, she's doing that, and that's a that's a nod to Tina Marie. And before that. Um, the Fugees yep. biggest comeback record is Fuji La, yep. which is an interpolation of Ooh La La Ooh La La. Yep. And so again, there's a lot of uh, tying Tina Marie into into hip hop. And as we're growing up, because by that time we are in our early late teens, early twenties, and still Tina Marie is a, is omnipresent in our lives. And we can't forget, of course, Firm Biz, the Firm, Nas, Foxy Brown, and AZ and Cormega come together to form this super hip hop group. And right out the box, yep. they, they came out with Firm Biz, which is a direct sample and interpolation of Square Biz. Yeah. So again, her, because of her, loyalty and uh, and and honesty and truthfulness to the art and to herself that reads to us mm-hmm. and i think that's why she has so much staying power and was able to be, to be black famous for so long still be um uh invited to the bet awards yep. and you know get to you know god bless him get to have that last performance mm. with rick james and you know and still be a viable part of the culture yeah. and not be and not be called out for trying to fake the funk. Man, that's real talk. Um, yeah, Tina Marie, definitely a one of one. There is not another before and not another since. 
in particular, when we talk about folks outside of black culture doing this kind of thing. Um, and listen, the bops are for real. Like you just, Tina Marie has a catalog full of bops, even on those last three records, which I, I would, and they're available. So go listen to LaDonia, Sapphire and Congo Square. Um, they're really, really, they're like, teen, they're really solid Tina Marie records where she was still writing and producing and doing all the things. Just nobody else like her. I had a great time on this conversation because I knew we were going to have fun. And we love everybody that has come through and has stuck around for this conversation the whole time. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. But before we get up out of here, J-Ray, please let the people know, the people that have just joined us, yes. let them know who we are. Yes. What we got on. Absolutely. And where they can get it. Yeah. So thank you all so much for um, just tuning into Q Points and hanging out with us. If you want that shirt that Sir Daniel has on, that is our Slow Jams Can Heal Us shirt. If you visit the Q Point store, you, we have that and many other things, mugs and bags and the whole thing um, that you could check out in the store. So we highly encourage you to go over there. It helps to keep these lights on. You see how we're, we're illuminated and how we are sound good. That helps us to do all of those things. So you could do that over there. Um, but if you can hear us, if you can see us, you are doing the first amazing thing. And that is tuning in. So hit subscribe wherever you are. Tell your friends, family, colleagues about the show, because if you love it, they will love it too. Sign up for our newsletter at qpoints.com. That's Q-U-E-U-E points.com. And um, also visit our magazine. That's, Q that's magazine.qpoints.com. And stay in touch with all things Q points. That about does it. I love it. Listen, in this life, you have a choice. You can either pick up the needle or you could let the record play. I am warm and peaceful DJ Sir Daniel. <laughs> and I am Star Child J Ray. <laughs> and this has been Q Points Podcast, dropping the needle on Black music history. Thank you so much, and we will see you on the next go round. Peace. Peace, y'all.